Thank you.
this song, Hosanna, from Palm Sunday, I initially had a guitar player, and then I didn't. And so uh, most of us are being pushed out of our comfort zones at this time. So I thought, okay, I'll be pushed out of my comfort zone. Um, I've never played guitar in public. I played for Girl Scout troops many years ago. Um, I'm kind of self-taught, but I thought my mom could do it at 52 and play for a, a prayer meetings into her 60s and 70s. Um, I can do it at 60. So, so um, may the Lord bless me as I hope to bless you as we praise God for when Christ came to Jerusalem, um, the people's king came to them riding humbly on a donkey. He was righteous but poor. The Passover crowd knew about his miracle, the miracle of Lazarus' resurrection, and the people laid their cloaks on the road and they waved palm branches, yelling, Hosanna, Hoshiana in Hebrew, translated meaning, please save. Jesus came not to establish an earthly kingdom, which was what they were hoping for, but Jesus came to invite us all into his heavenly kingdom. He will return one day triumphant mm -hmm. on a white horse who's mm -hmm. honored to our King of Kings. people 
welcome to Tri-County Alliance Church on Palm Sunday. I'm Jim Newberger, and I would like to greet you and say happy Sunday. We're so glad you're joining us this morning here online as we're able to use the resources that the Lord has given us to reach out to you wherever you are in your home or uh, around the state or even around the country. We are happy you're with us today. Um, we're, let's start with the word. In Psalms chapter 18, verse 30, the word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all of those who trust him. Let's stand on the, Lord, the Lord's word today. And I would like to again say thank you and welcome you to church. And we're so grateful that you're with us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us this time in history. Thank you for the trials. And thank you for being a shield to us. Thank you so much for your blessing. Father, we know that all of the things that are taking place, all of the fear, all of the uncertainty, all of the speculation, all of the reality, everything, Father, all of this is known by you. There is nothing that takes you by surprise. You've been through this before, and you've carried your children time and time again. Thank you for letting us be part of your family. And Lord, today we reach out to those amongst our church family and those that are believers in you that are hurting today. We pray for a healing touch on them, whether it's from COVID-19 or any other problem. Father, we pray your healing hand on them, especially those that are nervous and scared. Help us to know that we can trust in you. And Father, we lift up the, persecu the persecuted church around the world. Lord, there are those that need to hear your word because they are facing persecution simply because they're believers in you, Lord Jesus. And we pray your we pray your strength. We pray that you would cover them and surround them and help them to know that they are not alone. Give them the strength to endure what you've called them to do. And if it is your will, that you would relieve them of it. Father, thank you for this Palm Sunday. Thank you for every member and every person that comes to Tri-County Alliance, Alliance Church and those that are joining us online. Again, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray you would bless the sermon this morning and help us to focus on you. Amen. Amen. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to Tri-County Alliance Church. And um, a quick announcement, uh, we do still continue to uh, carry out the ministry of the church, and we're going to need your help as the, as the times change. Um, if you are able to donate, online, please do, to give your tithes and your offerings. Uh, you can just go to the church website. It's really easy to do. I'm 56 years old, and I figured it out, so I'm pretty sure you can too. Uh, if that is uh, not an option for you, feel free to uh, drop your offerings or your tithes uh, in the mail and send them in. Uh, even though we are not meeting due to executive orders, uh, we still have our expenses, and we still need to serve the Lord. So with that, I would like to say thank you. God bless you, and happy Sunday. Well, greetings once again, Tri-County Alliance Church family and friends. My name is Pastor David Fogel. I have the privilege of, of pastoring uh, this church and being together with you. Thanks for tuning in from wherever you are, and greetings on this Palm Sunday. And uh, there are a few people, uh, not many, but there are a few people here in the room with me as we kind of get used to this new normal. There's uh, uh, the people that you've probably seen already, the ladies who have so wonderfully led us in worship, and Jim Newberger, who's greeted you with his striking new haircut, <laughs> and then there's a couple of our tech team uh, people here making it all happen. And, uh, but it feels like uh, our church family is here. Our uh, the lady who uh, uh, supports us and works in our office took it upon herself to take pictures from the church directory, print them out, blow them up in color, and put them on the backs of the chairs. We've sent out videos, and it's out on our Facebook page and so forth, and you can see it. 
strategically placed as to where people normally sit as creatures of habit. And uh, so it almost feels like for you who call this uh, your church home, it almost feels as though you're here uh, in person, but grateful that uh, you're there and tuning in. And uh, I'm excited about opening the Word of God uh, together this morning on this Palm Sunday, what begins uh, the Holy Week in our Christian faith, bookended by Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday and everything uh, that's in between. And uh, uh, we will have a Palm Sunday special this morning. Uh, we have been, if you've been worshiping with us for some time, you know we have been going through a series entitled The Journey, where we're taking one book of the Bible at a time, one book of the Bible, one Sunday. And uh, we are going to put that on the back burner uh, this morning in order to honor the occasion. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would please, to Mark chapter 11. Hopefully you have a Bible somewhere around where you are. If not, feel free to hit the pause button and go find one and come back and, uh, and tune back in. Uh, Mark chapter 11 is where we are this morning. Mark chapter 11, and I will read the first 11 verses. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. Verse four. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Today really does mark a beginning, a significant beginning, a historic, world-changing, life-changing beginning. This is the beginning of Holy Week. While this feels different, not being able to worship together in person, what has been true and celebrated for 2,000 years is still true and celebrated today. Around the world, Christians are celebrating and remembering events that are so incredible that we still remember them and we still celebrate them 2,000 years after they happen. What else do we remember? What else do we celebrate that happened 2,000 years ago? Although there are many things that separate us, Catholic and Protestant, and within Protestantism, a countless number of denominations. But there is one thing about which all Christians agree. Holy Week is the center of the Christian faith. For one glorious week, all of our differences of language and culture and race and doctrine are forgotten. And what a week it is. Eight days that begin today with Palm Sunday and ends one week from today on Easter Sunday. Two great events bookend Holy Week. The triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. Without a doubt, it is truly a Holy Week because it encompasses the most sacred events of the Christian faith. All the things that we hold on to and cherish the most 
were proven to be true during this great week in Jerusalem. I, I love this story told by a, a really, really good former pastor of a pretty historic church in the Chicagoland area. The year was 1902, 118 years ago. A young, bustling, up-and-coming congregation prepared to build a new sanctuary for them to worship in. It was the first Presbyterian church of Oak Park, Illinois. And they hired one of the great architects of the Midwest, a man by the name of W.G. Williamson. And their assignment to him was simple. Build us a sanctuary that will lead us to worship the grandeur and the greatness of God. And this architect succeeded far beyond their wildest dreams. What resulted was a beautiful sanctuary that is still worshipped in today, even though the church has changed names. It's clear that Mr. Williamson was not just a master architect, but he was a, he was a good theologian as well. Because he saw clearly that Holy Week stood at the center of the Christian faith. And that's why the huge stained glass window on the east side of the sanctuary has a picture of a woman holding a palm frond, a palm branch. It's a scene from the first Palm Sunday. And the stainless glass on the other side, the west side of the sanctuary, shows an angel blowing a trumpet on that first Easter morning. And that church has been worshiping in between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday ever since. I love that. It was an inspiring choice because the very architecture of that room brings people back again and again to the central realities of the Christian faith. You know, of all the, the biographies that we can read of famous people, few of them devote more than 10% of their pages to the person's death, including biographies of men like Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi, who both died violent as well as politically and culturally significant deaths. The Gospels, though, the biography of Jesus, devote nearly one-third of their pages to the climactic last week of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John saw death as the central purpose of Jesus' life. Only two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, mention the events of his birth. All four of them offer only a few pages on his resurrection, but each Gospel writer gives a very detailed account of the events leading up to Jesus' death. Maybe like you, for several years, my, my discipline has, has been kind of like this as Holy Week approaches. I, I read all the, the gospel accounts together, uh, trying to find something new. Some nugget that I haven't gleaned before from this last week of Jesus' earthly life. Something that will strike me as new in what to me has become a familiar story. Something that will help me look at it all through a different lens. Give me a, a perspective, perhaps, on different characters in the story. This time, as I've read and as I've studied and as I've reflected, I, I'm swept away by the sheer drama, the power, the fact that no miracles break in, no, no supernatural rescue attempt to, to take Jesus down from the cross before he died. This is tragedy that's well beyond anything that Shakespeare could write about. I'm struck by the sheer power of the world. The most sophisticated religious system of that time joining forces with the most powerful political empire and joining forces 
uh, uh, together and ordering itself against one solitary figure. The only perfect man who's ever lived. And even though he's mocked by those powers and abandoned and betrayed by his friends, yet the gospel gives this ironic sense that he, Jesus himself, is somehow overseeing the whole process. We get the sense, the very real sense, that this whole thing was never really ever outside of his control. I love the telling words of Luke 9, 51, that tells us that as the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for the city of Jerusalem. Jesus resolutely set out, firmly resolved, determined, set in purpose. When you are resolute, it means you just have that look in your eye, like nothing will stop you. Jesus made several trips to Jerusalem during his lifetime. But Luke goes farther this time because there's something unique. There's something unordinary. There's something special about this particular trip. He telescopes this one to, to make his point that Jesus knew that he had to get to Jerusalem to present himself as the Messiah and then depart. He knew he had to get to Jerusalem to do that which he knew he was sent to earth to do. He was resolute in his mission and in his travel. Jesus knew that he must suffer and die at the hands of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. It was all part of a, a sovereign plan, all part of his sovereign plan. He never lost control. He never took his hands off the wheel. We see that in prophecy fulfilled. In the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, the, this whole idea of a Palm Sunday, Jesus riding into the city on a donkey, prophesied in Zechariah 9, 9, how beautiful. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Prophecy given in Zechariah, prophecy fulfilled in Jesus on Palm Sunday. The psalmist tells us, in Psalm 118 and verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Jesus knew he was on a mission. A mission that had been set in place long before. And when he headed for Jerusalem, to begin what, what, what we call today Holy Week, he resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing full well the fate that awaited him. The cross has been his goal all along, and now as his death nears, he still calls the shots. We call it the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday. All four Gospels mention this event. If you have notes that I, I would have sent uh, to many of you, uh, you can see the references there. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, uh, John 12. And as we read these accounts, it, it, at first glance, it seems like this is, this is one departure from Jesus' aversion to fanfare. He didn't like all the, the fuss and, and the attention and people making a big deal about him. But here he makes an exception. Crowds spread clothes and, and tree branches a, across the road to show him their adoration. 
They said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they shout. And Jesus usually shrinks away from stuff like that, from such displays of fanaticism. But this time he just let them yell. To the indignant Pharisees, the, the stodgy religious leaders of the day who, who are complaining about the noise. Jesus explained, I tell you, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out, Jesus said in Luke 19.40. Was the prophet from Galilee now finally being vindicated in Jerusalem? Look how the world has gone after him, the Pharisees complain in John 12.19. At that moment, with several hundred pilgrims assembled in Jerusalem, it looks for all the world as if the king had arrived in full force to claim his rightful throne. As a child, I remember back, and maybe this was something like your childhood, I, if you grew up in the church, I, I, I did, and when we're going to church, around this time of year, around this season, and we get to Palm Sunday, and, and everybody seems so happy and excited, and sometimes as kids we would march into the, uh, the sanctuary during the service waving our palm branches to commemorate that occasion, that celebration. And everybody was excited and so happy, and we celebrated on that Palm Sunday, and then just five days later, I would come back to church, come back to that same place in that same room on Good Friday. And it was all so somber and sad. So as a kid, I remember going from Palm Sunday to Good Friday and thinking, wait a minute. How can we be so happy on Sunday and then so sad and disappointed and discouraged on Friday, what's changed? It's like, wait a minute, with such a crowd throwing such a party for him, throwing themselves at his feet, cheering his every move one week, how did Jesus get arrested and killed the next? Now, when I read the Gospels, I... I, I can see undercurrents to kind of help explain this, this seismic shift. On Palm Sunday, there were a few different groups of people who, who were there in the crowd. Uh, there was this group from Bethany, from where he just came, who surrounded him. Bethany was where his good friends, Lazarus and Martha and Mary, lived. Bethany was the, uh, the one town where Jesus, Jesus always seemed to be welcomed and, and received well, there was this a group from Bethany from where he just came who surrounded him and they're still ecstatic and, and they're, they're buzzing over this miracle that just happened where Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. And, and no doubt pilgrims from Galilee who knew him well made up another large portion of the crowd. Uh, we're told uh, in Matthew where he points out in, in chapter 21 Verses 14 through 17, he, he gives us a glimpse of the people who, who were there. That, that further support for Jesus came from the blind and the lame and, and the children. And so, so they were there. But beyond these groups, danger was lurking. The religious establishment was there. They resented Jesus. And then... Roman legions were brought in to control the, the festival crowds. And a partnership, an alliance is formed. Religious establishment, Roman authorities. They would heed the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders' assessment, their, their wishes of, of who, may, who might present a, a threat to the established order of things. So you have that alliance combined with people who had unrealistic realistic expectation of Jesus and that he would simply be an earthly ruler who would help them overthrow 
the Roman government. Jesus himself clearly had mixed feelings during this big, noisy Palm Sunday parade. Luke reports that as he approached the city, he began to weep in Luke 19.41 because he knew the fate that awaited him. He knew how easily a mob can turn. He knew that the voices who shout, Hosanna! on this day, would shout crucify him a few days later. I want to make some application for us this morning, and then I want to give you from here to there uh, an invitation. And it's an invitation that I hope you'll take very, very seriously. And if it's an invitation that's received and embraced, I believe it'll change your life. I'm asking the question this morning, fan or follower, are you and I a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus today? I was given a book a few years ago by my good friend Cliff, and uh, it was entitled just that, Fan or Follower, written by a pastor, uh, author named Kyle Eidelman. And he started out the book by uh, saying that it, it was just before Easter and, and he was wrestling with, okay, the crowds are coming, the crowds are coming. It was a, a large church. They were expecting many people to come. And, and how, what do I say to draw a crowd? What do I say to appease a crowd? What do I say to a, the crowd on Easter Sunday? And he found, uh, made a discovery that when Jesus had a large crowd, he would often preach a message that caused people to leave. Uh, we're so tempted today to declare a message in the church that draws people and, and keeps people happy and, and keeps them here. Maybe even a, a temptation to water down the harder edges of our faith. But Jesus didn't do that. In John chapter 6, great chapter of the Bible, I encourage you to turn there now or just read through it later. In John chapter 6, Jesus is uh, he's addressing a crowd that has grown to more than 5,000 people. Jesus has never been more popular. Crowds of people followed him into the countryside, into the desert, along the seashore, up the mountainside, hungering just to hear him teach, to hear him preach, to hear him speak the things of God. Very few preachers and teachers have this problem today. His healing prowess was big news. Word has spread about his miraculous healings and his inspirational teaching. In John chapter 6, this crowd of thousands, this crowd of fans have come to cheer Jesus on. After a few days of teaching, Jesus knows the people are getting hungry. And so he turns to his disciples and, and he asks, what are these people going to eat? What are we going to do for food? One of the disciples uh, close to Jesus, a guy by the name of Philip, tells Jesus that even with eight months wages, it wouldn't be enough to buy bread. So Philip wasn't a lot of help. But there was another disciple, one of my personal favorites, named Andrew. Andrew's been looking over the crowd, and he spots this boy who's got five loaves of bread and two small fish. Andrew brings the boy to Jesus. Jesus takes the boy's lunch, and he, he uh, feeds the entire crowd with it. In fact, the Bible tells us that that evening, after everyone had their fill, there was still plenty of food left over. And we call this the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Interestingly enough, other than the resurrection, it is the one miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four gospel accounts. So after dinner, the crowd decides to camp out for the night 
so they can be with Jesus early the next day. I mean, these are some big time fans of Jesus. The next morning when the crowd wakes up, of course, they're hungry again. So they look for Jesus, otherwise known as their meal ticket. But he's nowhere to be found. These fans are hoping Jesus would give them an encore performance. Then eventually they realize that Jesus and his disciples have crossed over to the other side of the lake. And by the time they catch up with Jesus, they are absolutely famished. And they've missed their chance to get breakfast, but there's still time for lunch. But Jesus has decided to shut down this all-you-can-eat buffet. He's not handing out any more free samples. In verse 26, Jesus says to the crowd, in John 6, 26, he says, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me. What a sad reality. And the sadness that Jesus must have said these words with. He says, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, because, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus is no dummy. He knows that these people are not going to all the trouble and all the sacrifice because they want to follow him, but it's because they want free food. It wasn't Jesus himself they wanted. It was only what they thought he could do for them. In verse 35 of chapter, John chapter 6, Jesus offers them himself. He offers them himself, but the question is, would that be enough? Verse 35, then Jesus declared, and this is the first of the, uh, the seven great I am statements in the book of John. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the source. I am what you need and all you need. Suddenly, Jesus himself is the only thing on the menu. The crowd now has to decide if he'll be enough. Just like you and I today on this Palm Sunday, 2,000 years later, need to decide is Jesus himself enough? Is he enough? They had to decide that. They had to decide if he will satisfy their life or if they need something more. And here is what we sadly read toward the end of the chapter in verse 66 of John chapter 6. It said, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Fan or follower this morning, today. Many of the fans turned to go home. Interestingly enough, Jesus does not chase after them. He doesn't chase after them, nor does he soften his message to make it more appealing, somehow easier for them to swallow. He doesn't send the disciples after them to coddle them and coax them back. Jesus seems okay with the fact that his popularity has declined. It's not about popularity, it's about truth. And there's a temptation, a very real temptation in the American church today where it becomes more about drawing a crowd. More about handing out free bread and less about following Jesus. He's the main attraction. Him. There's a temptation to make following Jesus sound easy. If I've ever done that, I'm sorry. Following Jesus is wonderful. It's the best thing in life. 
There is no greater, more rewarding, no more fulfilling way to live your life than in full pursuit, relentless pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has pursued you and died for you. Following Jesus is wonderful and it's rewarding, but it's hard. It does require sacrifice. It's a lot easier to just be part of the crowd. It's a lot easier to just be part of the Palm Sunday crowd rather than to stick with it at the foot of the cross on Friday. But the Christian life includes both sides of the spectrum. Forgiveness and repentance. Salvation and surrender. Happiness and brokenness. Blessing and sacrifice. And it's all about him. He's enough. And oh, for us to be not like the fans who walked away, but to be like Peter, as imperfect and as flawed as he was. Peter said this when Jesus looked at them and said, Are you too going to walk away? And Peter says, And I hope you say, where else are we going to turn? You alone have the words of eternal life. I want to invite you from wherever you are on this Palm Sunday to make a declaration. Maybe you've been uh, walking with the Lord. You've been a Christian for some time. But your walk with the Lord has grown cold and callous distant, going through the motions. You want something to come alive again. I encourage you to call on Jesus and drive a stake in the ground and say, I don't want to just be a fan. I want to be a follower. If you've never made the decision to trust in Christ, today is the day of salvation. We are sinners. We are sinful people. All we have to do is read the newspaper and turn on the television and if we're honest enough, just evaluate our own lives, our attitudes, our thoughts, our actions, the words that we speak. We know that we're sinners. And we're made by a holy God who can't look upon sin. And so God, in his holiness and his mercy, Send his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross, the cross of Calvary, where God's holiness, his wrath, and his justice fully satisfied, and at the same time, his mercy and his grace and his kindness and compassion fully extended for sinners like you and me. And if we were to call out to him today, he will hear us. He will come into our life. He will save us, and he will change us forever. And I hope you make that decision today. And I'm going to pray a prayer. I invite you to just bow your heads with me as we pray together from wherever you are. Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. Thank you for this week in the life of the church. This is a historic week. And we thank you that Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live and died the death that we deserve to die, that we might be forgiven and free from the penalty of our sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the presence of sin. Thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And before he ultimately went to the cross, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem knowing what was awaiting and knowing that the Palm Sunday crowd would turn into the Good Friday mob. And Lord, for those who are listening today, um, I pray that maybe if they've known you and been a Christian for some time, that you'd reignite a flame, a passion in their life where they say, I just, I want to go all out for Jesus. 
He's gone all out for me. I want to go all out for him. I don't want to just be a fan. I don't want to just be a casual Christian. But I want to be in the battle. I want to be on fire. I, want to, I don't want to be on the sidelines. I want to be out on the field living for him and fighting for him and telling whoever I can about him. Lord, would you do that in the lives of your people today? And for those who may be listening who have never trusted in Christ for salvation, they've gone about life their own way and maybe felt like their own you know, good works and, and their own lives. And, and uh, hopefully if I can just be a good enough person. And, uh, Lord, that's false religion. None of us are good enough. If we, were, if we were good enough, if we could somehow earn it, then why would Jesus have to come in the first place? And so, Lord, I pray for that person today that may be listening, that they might pray, even as I pray along with, that they pray along with me something like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Thank you that you came to this world 2,000 years ago and lived a, a perfect life and uh, you... Uh, set out uh, for the cross, giving your life as a ransom for many. That you did that for me, Lord Jesus, and I put my trust in you, in Christ alone for salvation. And then uh, you helping me. And by your grace that saved me, I pray that your grace would then empower me to live the, the Christian life, the life that you've called me to live. Not perfect, but Lord, forgiven and growing and moving forward. We ask you to come into our lives, Lord Jesus. Fill it. Be the center. And Lord, we love you. We thank you today. Because you are worthy. And we say, Hosanna, the Lord save us. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we celebrate today in that name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. I look forward to celebrating together with each of you and hopefully many others next Sunday on Easter Sunday. And until then, God bless you and go serve your King.